I don't want to just give you a nice presentation, a nice speech, because that's going to do no, no good as we go forward. What I need to do is I need you to be able to give this presentation. So we're going to practice this today, okay? Now, I was a teacher before, so you got to work with me. Everybody hold up four fingers. Okay? Here's the issue. We have four whys. We have four whys, okay? The first why is simply why. Why the difference? Isn't that absurd? Why the difference? You come all the way to the West, and now you've got this sea of red where the federal government simply controls all of the land in the West. Why? Now people will say, oh, your land is so rugged, therefore the federal government keeps it? Really? But that's the argument. That's the argument. So the first one is why. Why the difference? Now, now the second one, let me tell you a little story. See if this sounds at all familiar. The Western states got fed up with this. And so they got together. And when they got together, they, they, they began to send petition after petition, resolution after resolution, delegation after delegation to Congress. And here's what their complaints were. You're not disposing of our land like you promised. We can't tax the land to educate our children. We can't grow our economy and provide good paying jobs in our state to keep people here rather than, rather than fleeing the state. And you're hoarding our abundant natural resources and minerals. Does that sound familiar? That was 1828. 1828, and the self-described western states, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And in 1854, because in 1854 they secured the transfer of their lands by act of Congress. Now, so that leads us to the second question. The second question is, why did they succeed? Why were they successful with the same problems that we have today? Never mind the fact that you'll hear people in our Salt Lake Tribune and others who say, oh, this is unconstitutional. Really? Then why did they succeed with the same problem with the same constitution? Why did they succeed? Why were they successful? Because they knew their history. They knew their rights. They banded together and they refused to take no for an answer. That's the third. So we got two whys now, right? So the third why, why does it matter? Why does it matter? In Utah, we have a $2 billion per pupil education funding gap and we have trillions sitting in the ground. Did any of you see last week the Government Accountability Office reporting to Congress, testifying to Congress, the Government Accountability Office testified just last Thursday that in Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming, there is more recoverable oil than all the rest of the world combined. We also know that Erskine Bowles, the Clinton White House Chief of Staff, David Walker, the independent auditor, chief auditor for the United States under Clinton and Bush, they both said, we have two years, maybe a little less. Erskine Bowles, this was a year ago, guys. He said, we have two years, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, until we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. David Walker said, we have three years until we face a total fiscal collapse. He said, and you states that get 30 to 50 percent of your budget from the federal government, it's going away. We've seen the high water mark. In fact, you know that after Erskine Bowles gave that testimony to the Senate Budget Committee a year ago, of course, Congress got busy and fixed the problem, right? Right? We had the debt ceiling fiasco where they couldn't solve anything. They said, let's kick that can down the road to a super committee. Here was the super committee's job. The super committee's job was to cut $1.2 trillion over 10 years. Never mind, we're overspending by a trillion and a half a year. And, and, and their, their, their charge was, let's not get hasty, start cutting that about four to five years from now, and they couldn't do that. Now, in federal law, the way it was written was, if the super committee failed, which we know now that it did miserably, if the super committee fails, then there will be 9% across the board cuts in federal spending, including the $5 billion that comes to Utah and to, North, to New Mexico and all the other western states, all the states across the nation. That starts January 1 of 2013, guys. Why does it matter? We have trillions in the ground. We will answer to our children, in the words of my good friend Senator Lee. We will stand accountable if we don't. 
We have trillions in the ground. We have the same rights, the same promises that were made to all the other states. In 1828, they succeeded. What's our problem? That leads to the fourth why. We've got the four whys now, right? Why? Why were they successful? Why does it matter? Why aren't we doing something about it? Why aren't we doing something about it? Why isn't this the cause of our lives? It's right there. The very ideology that we live under is under attack. The right and control of property and liberty, which leads to prosperity, which allows me to bless your life. And in return for me blessing your life, you, you give me something in return that, that, that I value more than what I gave you, and we create wealth. That's our very ideology. That's our system. That's what this nation was founded on in an unprecedented fashion. That ideology is under assault by those who would centralize the command and control of property and the means of production. And also, they would tell you that you have the liberty to do what I tell you you can do. Those are two competing ideologies. And the sage grouse is merely a tactic. And the hookless cactus is a tactic. And the Clean Water Act is a tactic. And shutting down access to our land is merely a tactic in taking over the right and control of property and liberty so that we can bless each other's lives and create prosperity, the greatest prosperity this world has ever seen, the greatest liberty and freedom and happiness this world has ever seen is under attack. So, why? Why did they succeed? Why does it matter? Why aren't we doing something about it? What we need to do is to study. We have to know, like they did in 1828, we have to know our history. We have to know our rights. We have to band together with the other Western states and states beyond the Western states. Let's band together with those 1828 states that succeeded already and then refuse to take no for an answer. Here's what we do. On the website, you've got the card, arewenotastate.com. We've put enough information in there. We've got, we've got 200 years of history on one page so you can duck away from American Idol during the commercials and get the history. We don't want to inconvenience you too much now in the fight for liberty, do we? It's all right there on one page. Now take that and then go farther, right? Go farther. There's a legal summary in there that talks about a 2009 unanimous Supreme Court decision that says the consequences of a state's admission are instantaneous. It ignores the uniquely sovereign character of a state's admission into the Union for Congress to even suggest that they can somehow diminish what was bestowed upon us at statehood. And then the Supreme Court, unanimous United States Supreme Court, made this statement. This proposition applies with even greater force and effect where virtually all of a state's public lands are at stake. The United States Supreme Court said that Congress cannot change the vested rights of our admission as a state, particularly where all of our public lands are at stake. We have to know our history. We have to know our rights so that we can stand with conviction.